Thank you for tuning in to Facebook Live to hear my story. My name is Helen Hoffenberg, and I am the daughter of Holocaust survivors. My parents survived World War II as Jews in Europe who were targeted by Adolf Hitler, a terrible man to be murdered. My father came from a family of eight children. My mother from a family of seven children. Of their grandparents, parents, siblings, spouses, nieces and nephews, only my parents survived along with one of my father's brothers. I never knew grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, or any other extended family members. The theme of my story is gratitude, which may sound inconsistent to talk about loss and suffering in that context. When bad things happen, and you can still be happy about the good that occurs, that is gratitude. My parents suffered through tragic and horrific experiences, but they survived. And my father said he was grateful for all the good things that happened in his life. The Holocaust began on January 30th, 1933, when Adolf Hitler came to power and technically ended on May 8th, 1945. The systematic killing by Nazis ended in a death toll of about 6 million Jews. The final solution to the Jewish question, as the Nazis called the genocide, was devised by Hitler and carried out by thousands of his officers and soldiers, along with collaborators, regular people who turned a blind eye and allowed heinous treatment of people like my parents without any objection. Ordinary people played an essential part. My father, Alter, came from a small town, Lask, located about 20 miles southwest of Ludge, a large city where my mother, Branya, or Brandel, as she was called, <clears throat> lived with her family. One of her brothers, Yankel David, which in English would be Jacob David, owned a textiles factory, which was the major industry in Wuj. The textile industry is the world's oldest manufacturing line of work and involves the entire production sequence <clears throat> of natural and chemical fibers, such as cotton, wool, oil, into end user goods, including clothing and household items. My father was hoping to go into business with my mother's brother. At that time, my father was training to be a men's tailor and he was considered to be very, very promising and talented. During the potential business deal discussions, Alter met Brandel, his prospective partner's youngest sister and they fell in love. Brandel had two unmarried older sisters and tradition dictated that a younger daughter had to wait for her older sisters to be wed. So the young lovers promised themselves to each other and waited. Then fate intervened. The Nazis started to advance their agenda. On September 1st, 1939, German soldiers marched across the border into neighboring Poland, as you can see on the map here. The superior Wehrmacht forces advanced so quickly that the Polish government was forced to flee. On September 27th of that same year, the defenders of the Polish capital, Warsaw, gave up. Nine days later, the last remaining Polish troops laid down their weapons. Thus began a nightmarish occupation that would last more than five years. In Poland, 
In Poland, the Nazis had more time than they had in any other occupied country to implement their policies against people they classified as racially inferior. As stories of grim experiences began to emerge across Europe, my father's parents, pictured here, decided to flee to Russia, which they thought might be safer than their current homes in Poland. The entire family planned to leave their home in Lask, but my father wanted to stay with my mother in Łódź. Alter asked Brando's parents if he could stay with them in their home as he could, not afford, uh, he could not afford to live on his own. Defying tradition, not only did Brando's parents open their door to my father, which was scandalous, allowing a young single man to live in a household that included single women. They allowed my parents to be married in a small quiet ceremony in my mother's home, just before they were forced out of that home into the Woods ghetto. My parents were able to stay together as they were all brutally driven into the Ludge ghetto, leaving most of their belongings behind. During World War II, ghettos were established by the Nazis to confine Jews and gypsies into tightly packed areas of the cities of Eastern Europe. The Nazis most often referred to these areas in documents and signage at their entrances as the Jewish Quarter. These Nazi ghettos sometimes coincided with traditional Jewish ghettos and Jewish quarters, but not always. <clears throat> Pictured here are my mother's parents, Brando's parents, who allowed my parents to be married in their home. The term ghetto was originally used in the Venetian ghetto in Venice, Italy, as early as 1516 to describe the part of the city where Jews were restricted to live and segregated from other people. The Woods ghetto was a Nazi ghetto established by Germans for Polish Jews and Roma following their invasions in September 1939. It was the second largest ghetto in all of German occupied Europe, the largest being in Warsaw. On April 30th, 1940, when the gates closed on the ghetto, it housed over 160,000 residents in an area of approximately one and one half square miles. To provide perspective about those numbers, in the United States today, the average people of the average people per square mile is 100, and the most densely popula populated area of Manhattan houses about 50,000. So you can imagine the terrible conditions in the ghetto. Life in the ghetto was hard. The Jews were permitted to take only a few personalized items with them. In the process, being stripped of their homes, their property, having to leave everything behind. The ghettos were extremely crowded and often lacked basic electrical and sanitary conditions. Food rations were insufficient for the ghetto's inhabitants, and the Germans used brutal measures against the smugglers, including both public and private executions. My older son told me that while he was working on his bar mitzvah project about the Holocaust, he interviewed his grandfather and learned how he risked his life over and over again to smuggle in a bag of potatoes. Jews were forced to wear yellow stars of David, a badge of shame. This practice goes back to the first century and the requirements to wear the star of David with the word Jude, German for Jew, inscribed in letters meant to resemble Hebrew writing. It was then extended to all Jews over the age of six. Starvation increased 
and worsened in the ghettos, and many of the inhabitants became ill and perished. Because of its productivity, the Woods Ghetto managed to survive until 1944. This is my mother's sister, Hannah Sora. In the ghetto, she and her husband had a child who went blind as a result of malnutrition, went blind as a result of malnutrition. Hannah Sura died after contracting tuberculosis and my parents helped raise this child. And you will hear more about this a bit later in the story. As the Germans <clears throat> eradicated the ghetto, they transported the remaining population to Auschwitz and other death camps where most were murdered upon arrival. Though the Nazis tried to keep operations of camps secret, the scale of the killing made this virtually impossible. Eyewitnesses brought reports of Nazi atrocities in occupied Poland to the allied governments who were harshly criticized after the war for their failure to respond or to publicize news of the mass slaughter. This lack of action was likely due to the allied forces focusing on winning the war at hand, but it was also a result of the general incomprehension and disbelief with which news of the Holocaust was met and the denial that such atrocities could be occurring on such a scale. It was just impossible to believe. My parents watched the deportations. My mother's parents, siblings, nieces, nephews, and many extended family and friends were taken away, never to be heard from again. My father never again saw his family that Fred fled to Russia everyone perished. My parents were fortunate enough to re remain in the ghetto until it was ordered closed. Among the last to be deported, my parents were initially sent to Auschwitz, pictured here. Remember that blind nephew my parents were raising? When they got to Auschwitz, my father tried to convince my mother who was holding the child to hand him off to an old woman as they waited in the selection line. He knew what was happening. Old people, those unable to work, mothers with babies and young children who refused to give them up were all selected to be killed. My mother said she was in shock and before she knew it, my father wrenched their blind nephew out of my mother's grasp and handed him to an old woman in the line behind him, behind her. In doing so, he saved my mother's life. The old woman and, my, and the child were directed to the showers and my parents were sent to the work line, not to the gas chamber, which is what the showers really were. Here it is in my father's own words. Finally, when we come to Auschwitz and we go on the selection of the Mingelo, my wife has a brother. Mrs. Gomez, he was a tall guy, over six feet. Beautiful dressed. But that child, what he could do with, was blind. He was blind, not that he was both blind, he was born, a beautiful boy. He was four years old, or four years old, and he got blind. Completely not that he didn't get the food, he didn't get the knives, you know, he didn't get to live, so he got blind to lose up My husband, my, my wife, excuse me, my wife and my brother-in-law had a child, my brother-in-law had a child before, then he gave it to my wife. And we were standing together in line. I saw that people that that were right there, not just from before, they know what's going on. And they start hollering. Young women give away the babies to all the little women. Because if you're not going to give away the baby, you're going to go to the crematorium just like the others. When I stood the line, my brother, and I hear it. When I hear it, I ran out of that line. And I, there was a man who said, 
the way the baby should not leave. So I ran out to my wife. And I grabbed her away the baby. She said, Alta, what are you doing? She says to me, what are you doing? I said, never mind, give me the baby. So I took that baby. And I ran to another little woman. And I gave that, that, that woman that baby. I said, Bushi, please take that, take that child. Because uh, that's what they say, to give the baby to the other woman. So she took the woman to the child. On the way back, to run to, the, to that line, I got the I don't know if it was a German or it was a couple. He gave me the sticker on my head. The blood stopped running. Unbelievable. I took my hand on my head. And I had to hand of blood. But at that time, you know, in such a situation that I didn't feel that I had hit me. From Auschwitz, my parents were separated. My mother went to Bergen-Belsen, and my father was sent to Dachau, camps which were located in Germany. They both survived, ultimately were liberated from those respective camps, and stayed in Germany after the war ended. While imprisoned in Dachau, the wall pictured here, a German soldier discovered my father's tailoring skills. This German soldier singled my father out one day during roll call and mentioned to him, motioned him to follow. They were going out to the woods where they found a small cabin. At first, my father thought the soldier meant to kill him. He fell to his knees, fled for his life. Why do you want to kill me? I, I, I haven't done anything wrong. The soldier told him that he wanted my father to do something for him. I want you to sew fur coats into the linings of my, into the linings of the coats of my soldiers. You are a master tailor. I want you to stay in this cabin and I will bring you sewing supplies and everything you need. I will bring you food and water. My father, sewed fur linings in the coats of the soldiers. A similar story might be seen in the movie, The Pianist, starring Academy Award winner, Adrian Brody, based on a true story in Warsaw. The movie tells of a German officer who discovered a talented Jewish musician and kept him alive to entertain the soldiers. My father stayed alive by keeping them warm. Do you believe how lucky I was? That is the takeaway from my father. Gratitude that he was safe, well-fed, and that he said he was able to even bring food set aside to his fellow prisoners, prisoners in the barracks, saving many of their lives as well. After the war, those who survived searched for any living relatives, fathers, mothers, siblings, spouses. And with the help of international agencies, they were able to find some. And through a series of coincidences and extreme search efforts, my parents found each other and also found my father's brother, one sibling, none of whom knew the others were alive. My father's best friend, Alter Rosenzweig, found my mother in a hospital in Munich that had terrible conditions. She was so sick that she was listed as dead. He took her to an area in the countryside called Gardelagen on his motorcycle to recuperate. He told my mother that they would continue searching for her husband, but if they didn't find him, he wanted to marry and take care of her. As they continued searching for my father, they found him in Munich. They also found my father's brother completely by chance. My parents reunited and Alter Rosenzweig who originally found my mother remained a lifelong best friend. They all stayed in Munich and my uncle, the brother they found by chance had lost sight in one eye because of a shrapnel injury during the war. He decided to emigrate to Israel where he was advised that resources for the disabled were better at that time. 
My parents stayed in Munich and I was born there in 1946. You can do the math. <laughs> Immigration officials advised my parents along with my father's best friend to try to immigrate to the United States. Post-war Europe was chaotic at that time, as you can imagine, and we were finally able to acquire necessary papers enabling us to make the journey. We were cleared medically only after going to the mountains in Switzerland where we breathed the pure mountain air to clear our lungs. Without birth certificates, we received our green cards, which made it possible to go to the United States. 10 years ago, my husband and I went to Munich during a European vacation, and I got my first authentic birth certificate document. The Germans kept meticulous records. We went to Munich's version of City Hall. They looked through their files, and in five minutes, I had a record of my birth. I also found the address of where my parents lived in Munich during those years. The wounds of the Holocaust, known in Hebrew as Shoah or catastrophe, were slow to heal. Survivors of the camps found it nearly impossible to return home, as in many cases they lost their families and had been denounced by their non-Jewish neighbors. Multi-generational homes, homes that had been in families for generations, were, were claimed by Europeans when their Jewish occupants did not return. Friends of my parents visited current Poland and searched for their childhood homes. One friend tells about finding their home and ringing the doorbell. After identifying themselves as the previous owners, the current occupants hurled at them the household mezuzah, mezuzah they had found and kept. A mezuzah pictured here is a sacred scroll inscribed with Hebrew prayer, prayers and tucked inside a decorative case like this one. And then it's affixed to the doorposts of Jewish homes. Go away, this is our home, not yours, they yelled, hurled the mezuzah and slammed the door. Back to the story. When we arrived in the United States in 1948, we settled in Providence, Rhode Island where my sister Carolyn was born in 1950. Opportunities were scarce in what was then a fairly small town my parents decided to try to buy a business partnering with the same friend who found my mother, Alta Rosenzweig. Immigration officials helped to broker a deal with a tuxedo rental in Silver Springs, Maryland. Both men were expert men's tailors and while running the business, they also planned to provide alterations to the tuxedo customers. When the sellers dis discovered that the buyers were Jewish, they backed out. Frightened by the anti-Semitism they had just escaped, Alter Rosenzweig went to New York where he had a cousin who sponsored him and my parents went to Chicago. A successful furrier there was looking for a man's tailor to finish coats. The same skill that saved my father during his time in Dachau. We moved to the south side of Chicago where my sister and I went to a Jewish school. Life was finally beginning to look up for our young family. We were learning the language. My father had a good job and then tragedy struck again. A fire destroyed our home and we lost everything. My parents decided to relocate to another part of the city, rely on friends and start their own business. Once again, those extended family and friends helped and guided us. And we moved across town where many of my parents' <clears throat> friends lived and worked. One of them helped my father open a store 
and his cleaning and tailoring business took off. My mother helped to run the business, but it was hard for her. The ghetto, the concentration camps, and their difficult young lives took its toll. She suffered from insomnia, nightmares, extreme anxiety, and depression. We now know that these symptoms of PTSD <clears throat> were pervasive among survivors and contributed to qualifying for reparations which were then available from post-war Germany. Both my parents applied and through extreme long efforts finally received small stipends, which helped. As soon as they met residency requirements, my parents applied for citizenship. I remember spending many evenings with my parents, helping them with their studies as you had to pass a basic civics test in order to become a naturalized citizen. My sister, I did not need to participate <clears throat> as she was born in the United States. And I remember being so annoyed with her at the fact that she got away without having to study and pass a test. I remember that the, at the ceremony, when we were sworn in, my parents broke down in tears. They were very, very emotional about this accomplishment. My parents, especially my father, reached out to Lansman, people from their hometowns who took the place of and became the families they lost. Grateful for any connection they formed a new citizens club. And they were actively involved in Zionist causes to support Israel. All the new citizens <clears throat> felt a fundamental need, shared a fundamental need to have a Jewish state. My father, my father helped Mogan David Adam create he created um, a Mogan David Adam fundraiser for their first ambulance, and that name means the Red Shield of David. My father was instrumental in raising money for that ambulance and was so grateful and honored to have that privilege. Ultimately, my parents bought their own home, provided comfortable, comfortable for surroundings for their family. Education was paramount my parents made sure it was not a choice that my sister and I went to college and got extended degrees. They were so proud to host beautiful weddings. And once again, my father's tailoring skills were put to good use. He played a role in my wedding and made both his and my husband's tuxedos. As I mentioned, throughout her life, my mother suffered deeply she allowed herself very little joy. My father, however, went on to have a very sunny disposition. He always smiled, he was charming, and he maintained and deepened his faith in God. He was an avid reader. He loved music, especially hearing his daughters play piano. And classical radio was always heard in the background of our home and his store. He became a crazy baseball fan and loved watching his grandsons play in their little league teams. My parents were able to retire to Arizona and my father led services in the small sanctuary in the synagogue near their home, committing to his faith every day. He was a role model to the community he daily demonstrated tzedakah, charity, and he said if he only had a dollar, he would give what he could to those less fortunate. He always thought how lucky he was to have survived and to be able to have a wonderful life. I will leave you with a sad story that still has a beautiful side. When my father was very ill at the end of his life, he told me not to be sad. He said, look how lucky I am. I have two beautiful daughters, sons-in-law, beautiful grandchildren, 
And who would have thought that 50 years ago, I would have all this. Extraordinary words from an extraordinary man who always chose to see the positive and for, was so grateful for what he had. Nobel laureate, author and Holocaust survivor, Elie Wiesel said, when a person doesn't have gratitude, something is missing in his or her humanity. A person can almost be defined by his or her attitude toward gratitude. I am grateful that I have the privilege of telling this story. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, we do have a couple questions. Okay. Um, first, when did your parents first share their story with you? I mean, I know you were born in Munich, but when did you really hear the full story? So I get that question a lot. And um, my parents, like many survivors, didn't talk about their experiences. When we asked questions, my sister and I did ask questions. We were curious. They always said, this is not something we want to talk about. We want to put this behind us. And, and um, you know, we knew uh, about the story. You studied in school. And we knew who we were. The identity was embedded us in us very early on. And the first real glimpse into their stories occurred when my children, their grandchildren, or my sister's children started asking their grandparents about the, the experiences. As I mentioned, my older son did a bar mitzvah project about the Holocaust, and he talked to my parents extensively, and they were much more forthcoming with him than they ever were with us. And then I finally got details as an adult when they shared their story with um, the Shoah Project, with Steven Spielberg's Shoah Project, and the excerpt from the video, the excerpt, the video excerpt that you saw on one of the slides from my father came from those files. So yes, we were curious, but they really didn't talk about it. And then finally, as young adults and adults, we learned more and more. Yeah. Um I think you touched on this a bit, but what was it like growing up as a child of survivor? It was interesting. Um, every child, you know, knows, has a different experience, obviously, growing up. Um, I mentioned that my mother suffered from extreme anxiety and depression. Um, we, my sister and I had to constantly let her know where we were. She was very, very um, adamant and difficult about kind of not being nervous about anything that might happen to us. I remember as a child muffling a cough into my pillow because my mother would get so upset if she thought we were ill. Um, and, and there were happy parts, of course. My family was very close. My mother had friends and family over all the time. We shared dinners. Uh, the, survive, the other survivors that I mentioned, their friends and family who became my quote unquote aunts and uncles and cousins. Um, we had lots of fun times together, family get togethers. Um, I had a, a happy school experience as a child. And, um, you know, that part was good, but the anxiety, the depression, the extreme nervousness about anything bad happening um, really came through loud and clear. And of course, you don't think about that as a child growing up, but looking back, I know that that, that was the case. Um, so that was... And then, as I mentioned, my father was a very, um, he loved music and it was always a part of our lives. We sang all the time. Um, I remember Passover Seders, especially my father had a beautiful voice and my sister sang beautifully as well. We used to sit around the table and sing. So, you know, the whole, that Jewish experience was always part of our lives. And as well, the whole, the cloud hanging over about what they had gone through in their young lives also was a very big, it was a pervasive part of my upbringing. So, hope um, that answered your question. It yeah. did. <laughs> uh, what happened with the business your parents started? 
Okay, my parents um, started a, a store, a cleaning and tailoring store. It was very, very busy. I remember even as, uh, as young as being like 12 years old, my mother would always ask me to come and help if I could, you know, do my homework first. But if I had to come, if I had some time, come and help in the store. We lived very close to the store. And it, it was a very, very busy, busy busy store. Uh, my parents also, my mother was a very savvy investor and they bought quite a bit of property in Chicago and, you know, got some nice income from that. So, and when they decided to retire, they were quite young when they retired, they were in their late fifties, but my mother, as I mentioned, you know, battled those demons all her life. So they decided they were just going to sell everything, um, retired to Arizona. She had bad arthritis and they thought that, that she would feel better there. So they sold everything and then they retired. Brilliant. Um, you mentioned going to Munich. Um, what was that like? And did you go anywhere else in Europe? Yes, I traveled quite extensively. I worked in a, a career where I had traveled all the time. And so I was able to extend some of that business travel into um, European travel. I was lucky enough to go to Berlin as a business trip. And so my husband and I extended that trip into a, a quite a extensive journey throughout Europe. And as I mentioned, it was about 10 years ago that we did this and um, he planned it. I, it was a surprise because he knew I did not have a birth certificate. All my years growing up, I had to use my naturalization papers to uh, prove my birth and um, to document you know, my birth. And so he planned it. We, he said, let's go to Munich as part of our trip. We'd always wanted to go and we went to Munich. And as I mentioned, I got my birth certificate. I was hoping it would be a little bit younger than it was, <laughs> but it wasn't. And um, it was authentic. And yes, we've done quite a bit of travel. We've been a lot of different places. I love to travel. So during these current times, that's been curtailed. Um, fortunately enough, two years ago, we were able to take our entire family. I have six grandchildren. We took our entire family to, um, to Europe on a cruise and um, had a wonderful, wonderful time. So yes, I've, been, I've traveled extensively, both internationally and nationally. Um, how did you get involved with the museum? So um, I have a friend who was uh, one of the founding employees for the museum. She was the marketing, marketing director and was very instrumental in raising all the money to help open it. And um, she's been after me for years. She said, I have such a great story. Uh, she wanted me to become a docent. And my, my career, my work was very, very demanding. So I really couldn't do it um, while I was working. And when I retired, she said, okay, it's time, you gotta do it. And I was um, at, a, at an event at the museum. My husband works for um, the state and it was a, an event that they hosted for his group. And um, I met one of the education directors, mentioned that I was interested in getting involved. I was a second generation survivor and I didn't hear anything for a long time. And then several months ago, I, I heard from Amanda Friedman, who's the, um, wonderful education director here. And she asked me if I would be interested in becoming a part of the second generation speakers bureau. Um, unfortunately, the survivors are aging and um, not able to participate in the numbers or the level that they used to be able to. And so they were creating a second generation group. And then I applied, provided a uh, sample presentation. And fortunately, here I am. It's such a privilege and an honor to be here and um, was fortunate enough to become part of the group that way. So thank you all from the museum for keeping after me. <laughs> We're so happy to have you. Um, that is all the questions we have. So I will let you sign off. Great. Okay.